Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Harm Reduction Television. I'm Kenneth Anderson, your host, and this is for the Lower East Side Harm Reduction Center. We are bringing you a series of interviews with experts in harm reduction and uh, various aspects of addiction, um, alcohol, drugs, all, all those good things that you love so much. So tonight our guest is uh, Dr. David Hansen. Um, he has a website called uh, Alcohol Problems and Solutions. He's uh, been a professor at uh, SUNY Potsdam for a long time. He's Professor Emeritus now. Uh, he's pub done huge amounts of research in the field on alcohol. He's a board member of at St. Jude's Retreat. And David, welcome to the show this evening. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, what got you interested in alcohol research? Well, really, it's not a very interesting or exciting uh, uh, situation. Most people assume either that there are, is an alcoholic problem within my family, or conversely, that I am of a religion or belief system that prohibits drinking. In fact, uh, neither of those was the case. I simply uh, was looking for a, a project for my PhD dissertation. Uh, some of the topics I was interested in I met with yawns from various potential advisors, and so I realized that if I was going to be successful, I'd better pick a topic that one of my advisors found interesting. And I wasn't interested in the subject at first, but then with the passage of time, uh, I found it more and more fascinating, and now I can't understand why everybody isn't just totally absorbed in the subject. Well, what have you uh, discovered? Is, is Does the general public believe a lot of mythology about alcohol, alcoholism, drinking, all that? Yes, I suspect that the subject of alcohol is similar to the subject of sex, uh, in that it is simply overrun with mythology and false beliefs. Uh, it, it's almost easier to find the few truths than it is to identify all the false uh, ideas that people have. Uh, and it's just amazing. Uh, we have the idea, and it's very, very common, for example, that alcoholism is a disease, although there's no good evidence for that at all. In fact, the research strongly suggests it isn't. We have the idea that if young people begin drinking at an early age, that this is going to lead them to have problems later on simply isn't the case. Uh, we have the idea that if people uh, drink alcohol when they're still teenagers, that it's going to somehow harm their brains. Again, there's just really no good evidence of this. In fact, if we look at a natural experiment, uh, we can look at the people, for example, in Greece, uh, in, um, in Italy, southern France, uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, we can look at Jews, we can look at a number of groups in which people tend to drink every day uh, and they drink uh, from a very early age but yet we don't find that these people somehow have any mental uh, uh, deficits. Uh, in fact, if you look at standardized testing in the schools, they seem to do better than we do. So uh, from a uh, what we might call a natural experiment perspective, uh, there's no truth to it. And when you look at experimental evidence, there really isn't good support for those ideas. Um, is there any difference you found between young people that drink very heavily and young people that drink more reasonably? Well, yes. Um, it's interesting. Um, there have been studies that have found, uh, quite by accident actually, that people who drink uh, within the home, with the parents' home, tend to have fewer drinking problems. Now, that's consistent with what we know culturally. I, I just referred to a number of societies or groups in which people tend to drink regularly, uh, daily, but have relatively few problems. And if we look at those groups, we find that there are some commonalities among them. Uh, one of the commonalities or keys to success is that in these groups, people look at alcohol as a rather neutral substance. They don't look at it as a poison, and we tend to call it that a lot in our society. Uh, on the other hand, they don't look at it as some sort of magic elixir that's going to convert them into uh, popular people, uh, exuding charm and sex appeal. Um, they see it as a rather neutral sub substance that can be either 
uh, use in moderation for people's benefit and enjoyment, or that can be abused uh, to people's detriment. Uh, a second key point, uh, key to success, is that in these groups, there are two kinds of behaviors that are completely socially and morally and uh, legally equal. One is abstaining and the other is drinking in moderation. These are seen as equivalent. Uh, one is just as good as the other. But what is not accepted under any circumstance by any person of any age is the abuse of alcohol. And what this means in a practical sense is if they go to a party and somebody isn't drinking, you don't go up to them and say, oh, what's wrong? Uh, you know, are you sick? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, why are you being such a stick in the mud? And on the other hand, it means that you don't go up to people who are drinking and saying, oh, I see you're doing your favorite drug, huh? Uh, and uh, dumping on those people. It's a kind of live and let live so long as people are either abstaining or drinking in moderation. But what really um, brings social pressure and legal pressure and other pressures is when people abuse alcohol. And again, it doesn't matter who you are, your age, where you are, the circumstances. It's, it's considered completely unacceptable. And then the third main uh, key to success in these groups is that young people learn to drink in the home. They learn from their parents. Uh, and this is typically a safe environment in which uh, young people can explore. And if they overdrink, uh, they're in a safe environment. But they learn from the good example of their parents and the guidance of their parents. And so people in any of these groups would certainly agree with the idea that it's better to learn to drink in the parents' house than in a fraternity house, which is about the worst place to learn to drink. Um, now, just imagine that we decided to prepare people for driving in the same way that we currently prepare them for living in a world in which uh, drinking is common. And we would tell them that driving is dangerous, which it is. Tens of thousands of people die every year in non-alcohol related accidents. Uh, hundreds of thousands are injured every year driving. So we would tell them, number one, driving is dangerous. We would tell them that to be a good driver, you need to have physical maturity, which you do have, uh, do need to have. We would tell them that you have to be emotionally mature and that they're not emotionally mature yet. They aren't 21 or whatever age we select. We would tell them that driving safely requires knowledge of the road, the rules of the road. But we wouldn't teach them these because we would be concerned that this would send them a mixed message that maybe they should be driving when they really shouldn't. And we would uh, warn them of all these dangers and all these problems, but we'd give them no help. And then on their 21st birthday, we would hand them the keys to the car and say, here are the keys to the car. Now, we hope that you'll choose to use public transportation. But if you insist on driving, please try not to kill yourself and others. The roads would be a disastrous place, but that's exactly how we prepare young people for drinking, and we are surprised that we don't have better success than we do. <laughs> well, I've often used driving as a good example of uh, harm reduction in practice in the United States, we have all kinds of harm reduction devices in the U.S. connected with driving automobiles, such as seat belts to reduce uh, the problems, uh, you know, injuries from accidents. We have traffic lights, um, stop signs. We have traffic laws. You know, if we were going to treat driving the way we treat drugs, we wouldn't have traffic lights or, tra or traffic laws or any of these things. We would just say, well, if you drive, we'll arrest you. Right, exactly. You know, that's one of the beauties of harm reduction, as you well know, is that it's such a realistic approach to problems. It's a non-moralistic, it's non-finger-pointing, it's a non-ideological approach. It's eminently pragmatic, which is, I think, why it's so incredibly successful.
And of course, people can choose to abstain from driving, which I do. <laughs> and I always have. So, you know, it's not like I got in trouble and I had to quit driving. I never drove, so I never got in trouble with it. Lifelong right. abstinence from automobiles. <laughs> Well, except when I was on the farm growing up, I did drive a little bit on the farm on the private property, but I didn't wasn't interested in it. <laughs> so I want to pursue a little bit. Uh, you talked about the idea of disease. Uh, is drinking a disease? Is uh, drinking excessively uh, problematically with dependence? Is this a disease? And uh, I want to talk about the idea of behavior as a disease in general because you know if you start looking at history you can see that sometimes behaviors have been considered a disease homosexuality was considered a disease then due to popular vote at the American Psychiatric Association it was voted to not be a disease um, you can't really vote cancer not to be a disease I guess <laughs> that's right well one of the very early advocates of the disease theory, and I emphasize theory, it's a theory and it's an unproven theory that alcoholism is a disease. One of the early advocates, a guy named Jelinek, uh, uh, tried to put the matter to rest when he said a disease is whatever doctors choose to call a disease. Uh, and of course, as it turns out, uh, doctors in the past have identified a number of things as diseases that we would certainly uh, reject. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush is sometimes credited with being the first, uh, well, first person in uh, the last few hundred years, at least, to argue that alcoholism is a disease. Uh, but he also argued that negritude or having black skin was a disease, and he said that it's important for uh, blacks and whites not to marry because this would help spread the disease. Uh, and he also argued that. Um, that alcoholism is, is a disease. So I don't really find him a very credible authority on uh, what is a disease and what is not a disease. But currently, um, it is very popular to argue that uh, that alcoholism is a disease. And some of the advocates say, well, it doesn't really matter whether it's a disease or not. But by calling it a disease, we get money for treatment and other kinds of help. And also, if we call it a, it a disease, we will remove some of the stigma. And so they just say, well, who cares whether it's a disease or not? We call it that, and, uh, and everybody will be happy. I might, I might yeah. point out that the, uh, the AMA uh, voted on this way back in the 50s. Uh, they didn't really rely on scientific evidence at all. Uh, and I guess a cynic would have to say that the AMA simply wanted to ensure that it could get third party, which is to say insurance payment for uh, counseling or otherwise trying to help alcoholics. Well, to me, the whole stigma argument doesn't make any sense at all. I don't see gays and lesbians and bisexuals clamoring to be called disease so that they disease so they won't be stigmatized. They fought to be called, not called diseased to be, say, you know, this is our choice. Uh, this is what this is who we are. We're not diseased. We're people. Right. And you know, it's interesting. Um, in spite of the AMA's position. Uh, a very substantial proportion of American physicians explicitly reject the concept that alcoholism is a disease, and they report that they don't believe that medical treatment works. In fact, I don't think there is any good evidence that it works. Um, and so uh, the AMA is in a strange position of having a large proportion of its members rejecting the theory that it promotes. Well, it's also interesting that the uh, the treatment that doctors most often recommend for alcoholism is 12-step based, and if you look at that, it says, well, you ask God to remove your disease, and well, we don't treat any other disease like that. That's right. In fact, people don't realize that the 12 steps aren't really so original as a lot of people think. Uh, AA really emerged out of a fundamentalist uh, Protestant group back during the 30s, um, and uh, it actually 
took many of the Oxford group's uh, ideas and just slightly changed them to become the 12 steps. And uh, AA members will commonly tell you that AA is not a religion, that you don't have to submit your will to God, uh, only to a higher power, which they uh, say could be a rock or a doorknob or anything else you want it to be. However, the United States Supreme Court um, has let stand all the appeals court rulings that have held that AA is either a religious organization or that it engages in religious activities. So the Supreme Court has made it clear that AA is in fact a religious organization. And as you say, it's ironic that physicians most commonly simply send people to AA. It's not much different than saying, go down to the corner church or go over to the synagogue or, or go to the temple, wherever. Um, there really isn't much difference. Well, to me, it'd be a lot like if you went into an oncologist to get cancer treatment and he told you, go to the Church of Christian Science. Uh, God is all-powerful. We know that. So all you need is the power of God to cure your tumors. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, you've hit the, the nail on the head. And, you know, the First Amendment is really, it doesn't matter if you claim that you're a you're a religion or you're not a religion. The First Amendment is about protecting the right of the individual to have their own religious beliefs. And you know, if if my religious beliefs say that I don't want blood transfusions, you know, you can't give me blood transfusions. It doesn't matter if you have scientific evidence that blood transfusions are good. The First Amendment protects my right to say, no, my religious belief says no, and you can't give them to me. That's right. Another important point about AA is it just doesn't work. The short-term effectiveness, uh, which is the easiest kind of effectiveness to show, is um, about 5%. About 5% of AA members at the end of a year uh, have achieved some sobriety. Now, we can expect that that rate would decline over time. Um, so AA is not only quite ineffective, but federal research uh, looking at alcoholics across the United States has found that a higher percentage of alcoholics, people who have been um, diagnosed as alcoholic, have achieved sobriety on their own than achieved sobriety through AA. So it appears that AA may, in fact, be, be in hindering an individual's ability to become sober. And that may seem strange, but I think once you begin looking at AA's teachings, you can see some teachings that appear to be perhaps harmful to a recovery. Uh, the idea that, first off, that alcoholism is a disease, a chronic disease that if you are alcoholic you will always be alcoholic. Uh, the idea that alcoholics are helpless, they are powerless. Uh, the idea that, uh, uh, that if an alcoholic has any alcohol whatsoever they lose control uh, and they lose power over their ability to stop using or consuming alcohol. There's so many beliefs in AA that are contrary, really. And one of the things we know is that it, the more people believe in the theory of loss of control, which is to say that if they have a drink, they will lose control and relapse. The more people believe that, the more likely they are to relapse. So it becomes something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, my own experience was uh, absolutely horrible. Um, after going to AA for a while, I drank more than I ever had in my life. Um, I had to be medically detoxified. I was at danger of death from alcohol withdrawal. And at least my mind does not do well with the idea that alcohol is powerful and I am powerless. 
and I never did believe that higher powers that God cured diseases so none of it made any sense but getting that message repeated constantly over and over again that I am powerless alcohol is powerful um, certainly set me up to uh, greatly increase my drinking um, on the other hand um, I have to say because I work uh, in needle exchange I work in harm reduction programs and an awful lot of my co-workers are members of 12-step programs they like them they're very happy with them um, the the people I know that work in harm reduction that are also members of 12-step programs are exceedingly sane and rational I mean lots of us have encountered 12-step uh, people that are quite uh, extreme in their promotion of abstinence uh, no enabling uh, no harm reduction but I have to say that I have many colleagues uh, in in the harm reduction who are 12 step members they are totally supportive of, our, of harm reduction and see no contradiction at all so I certainly always want to you know respect their right to have their own beliefs okay, so I, I suspect that those folks have been successful in achieving their sobriety in spite of AA though it is possible that that approach works well for some people uh, who have a certain background, a certain orientation, and certain beliefs. If, if you believe that God does, in fact, intercede in life and, and guides us and uh, so on, then you might very well believe that uh, by submitting to God's will or the will of a higher power that you will be able to achieve sobriety. So it could work for those people. Mm -hmm. It could even be simpler. Uh, my doctor told me this was what to do. I believe my doctor. So it might be effective because of believing your doctor. That's right. <laughs> I think you've identified an interesting research study there, Ken. I would love to actually uh, talk about this. Uh, I would love to do some research on this because if you've ever worked in needle exchange, which I encourage everyone in the U.S. go volunteer in needle exchange, it will totally change your perspective on everything in your life, especially on drug users. You will see, guess what? They're all people. They're all human beings, just like you and me. They're not all these monsters you see on TV and Breaking Bad and those TV shows. Um, but uh, uh, as I said, I mean, not everybody. I'm sure not everybody I work with in needle exchange comes out and and says that they're affiliated, who they're affiliated or not affiliated with, but definitely uh, it seems like about half the people I know there are affiliated with 12-step programs. So it's a, it would be a very interesting group to do a study of. Indeed, uh, and of course I think the people who uh, don't find it effective tend to just drop out and they don't speak about it. Uh, the people who have uh, found it effective and useful are really proselytized. They believe they found the way and they're anxious uh, to proselytize really and to help other people by bringing them to the faith. You know there's some research on that I was talking with uh, Leanne Kaskutas about this and she actually found that uh, there's a very considerable number of people that go to AA for a while they use it for support group they don't really buy into all of it they quit drinking they leave after a while stay abstinent and they're very successful you know she said there's a you know she found just roughly speaking about a third become you know true believers about a third hang out for a while and stays successfully sober but you know eventually stop going to the groups and then there's another third that, that, that don't do so well mm -hmm. so that was very interesting to me and I think that's true for impressionistically because you know I've met a lot of these I've met a lot of people that are not fanatical as well as a lot who are well of course there are many different uh, groups uh, and I think that given the differing compositions uh, the groups will not always act identical to each other and uh, there's special interest groups for women for example or for older people younger people and so on and uh, uh, so a person might not be happy in one group uh, but then find a, a niche and then a comfort zone in, in another one if they look around and, and try to find it. Well, my suspicion is that the, th there's 10 percent of the people that do 90 percent of the talking and they're the true believers, you know. And there's a lot of others that are just, they're there, uh, that gives them something to do that's a non-drinking activity, but 
maybe they don't drink the Kool-Aid completely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be true in a lot. You know, that's true. I think that's true in a lot of churches, too, you know. You get some real extreme believers. A lot of people go there. It's a social thing, and it's not so extreme. Well, that's a, that's a whole other topic, I guess. Yeah, well, certainly, one of the things we know is that it, it, any group, it can be a, a political party, it can be a union, it can be a church, whatever. Um, there, the, there will be a small group of really true believers, people who are really strongly committed. Uh, and they tend to be a little more extreme than the vast majority who are more middle of the road uh, in that church or in that union or whatever the organization might be. And I think it would hold true in AA too, probably. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're the ones that often make the, that usually make the most noise. Right. Uh, well, as long as we're talking about uh, behavior and disease, I've come across some interesting ideas um, about schizophrenia. And uh, there's one paper I was looking at was talking about India and talking about schizophrenics. People that see visions are religious leaders, and if you look at a lot of religions, well, our own Judeo-Christian religion, the prophets saw visions, you know, was schiz were schizophrenics or in certain societies, are they treated as a leader group? Are they looked for it, to be the visionaries, to lead the, the people? And is it our society that is strange somehow because we declare their behavior diseased? And certainly a lot of groups, uh, Native American groups and many, many others, uh, um, people would use drugs to acquire a, a different... Uh, a, sense of consciousness and uh, and that was considered very very valuable they would take whatever the, the local drug was and uh, have visions or other sensations exp have experiences and uh, that helped make them sh to be shaman or whatever the, uh, the the religious leaders were in that area well I'm going to move on to another topic. Uh, we are both on the board of St. Jude Retreat, and this St. Jude Retreat takes a non-disease, non-treatment approach to addictions, and they use something called cognitive behavioral education. And would you like to talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral education? Well, yes. I think in a very general sense, uh, what we try to do at St. Jude's is is first of all, we help people prioritize their goals. It's not our goals, it's their goals. Now, ordinarily it will be to, uh, to abstain from certain substances, or it may be to use in moderation, although it certainly could be to increase their use. Uh, but those are their personal goals. They don't share them with the staff or anyone else. But we help them to really prioritize their personal goals. And then we teach them how to engage in self-analysis, analyze their past behavior, their present behavior, and see to what extent their behavioral choices have helped move them toward those goals or away from those goals. And we also teach them how to develop behavior patterns that are, that are more conducive to achieving whatever goals they have. Um, and we try to do a number of things, give them uh, tools to, uh, to manage their lives. But perhaps in the bigger uh, picture, one of the things we do is show them that these cultural myths are myths. Very important to teach people to help them understand that they are not victims of a disease, that alcoholism is not a disease, that drug addiction is not a disease, that they are powerful, that they, they have uh, the ability within themselves to make their own choices, to make good choices if they choose, make poor choices if they choose, uh, and help them understand that they will reap the consequences, good or bad, of whatever choices they make. Um, and we uh, help them develop a plan for their lives uh, from, from this time forward. And we could talk a lot about the 
the theories underlying cognitive behavioral education. But the thing that really impresses me is the proven success rate. And it was this that led me to agree to serve on the board of, uh, of the Baldwin Research Institute and the St. Jude program. The program periodically has independent outside research firms come in and conduct surveys of past guests, those who uh, attended the program. And rather consistently, the success rate has uh, been at least 62% success rate for long-term success in uh, creating a lifestyle that is free of unwanted uh, drug problems. Now, the real success rate is higher than that because a number of people will choose to moderate their substance use. And if they moderate their, if they choose to moderate their substance use and are successful in doing this long term, then I think anyone would agree that that's a success. But the way the program has defined success is very, very rigid. And if we included those successful moderation drinkers and users, then the success rate would be sub substantially higher than 62%. And when we compare this with alternative programs, uh, 12 step and uh, similar programs, um, the the uh, results are even more impressive. One of the problems is that St. Jude's is the only program in the country that has outside evaluators come in to do the research. If you go on the internet, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of rehab and treatment facilities advertising, and you will read glowing reports about how effective they are, and you'll even find some statistics. But there's no evidence that these figures are anything other than estimates, guesstimates, hunches, all of which are self-serving. And so these statistics really have uh, very, very low credibility. Objective scientific research has found that uh, most rehabs and most programs have very, very low success rates. Uh, we even refer to the revolving door of rehabs. People come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. They return, they return, they return. Now, I take this as evidence of ineffectiveness. However, the rehabs and the people who work there say this just proves how what a horrible disease addiction is and how hard it is uh, to cure. But uh, I think a, an objective look just doesn't support that, that rosy picture. Well, that's the traditional belief that people held for a long time, and an awful lot of people still hold this uh, false, uh, disproven belief, and that's the belief that addiction is 100% fatal. Everyone who's addicted, their only outcome is death, um, which you will see a lot in uh, AA literature, said that the only possible outcome is death, unless you are saved by the 12-step program. And so the 12-step program, you know, took credit for everybody that got better, even though, you know, the, the AA literature is so contradictory because, you know, Bill even talks about people that were cured by religion before AA was invented uh, to justify AA, but then he says that everybody that doesn't do AA surely signs their own death warrant. <laughs> So it's it well it's like reading the Bible you know it's it's full of contradictions. This page says the opposite of that page. Uh, you get contradictions in the same sentence sometimes. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people still subscribe to that. Uh, but you know the the recent studies we've had like the NISARC, the uh, National Epidemiological Survey of Alcohol Related Conditions, um, and they found the normal outcome of addiction. It, that was for alcohol, alcohol addiction. People eventually overcome it on their own. It can take a long time. That's right. But right. death is. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. Uh, the national uh, survey done uh, to which I referred a little bit earlier uh, found that of people who had been diagnosed as alcoholic, only 25% later uh, were drinking at the same heavy rate. Um, about 18% abstained, usually on their own. About 18% drank in moderation. And the remainder, except for that 25% of, of sort of, uh, well, of those who continue drinking heavily, uh, simply improved. Um, and this is, for the most part, without any help uh, from any program or any sort of outside intervention. Uh, so you're quite right that the natural course of, say, alcoholism is, uh, is not... Uh, De necessarily downward. In fact, those who continued on a downward path, more or more uh, problematic drinking, are really in the minority. Mm -hmm. And now, even with uh, cigarette smoking, you know, which people didn't used to quit smoking very much uh, when they didn't think it was bad, because it wasn't very easy to quit. But now that we kind of realized uh, this is not really good for your health. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of people that have quit smoking. Um, it's es estimated more there are what? There are more ex-smokers than there are current smokers, so more people have quit. It's quite amazing. And, and that's been over a period of a few decades, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know it's, it's much like uh, drunken driving. Uh, before MAD came on the scene in 1980, uh, there were comedians on TV whose shtick was to act drunk. Uh, and there were jokes about uh, uh, drunken driving and intoxicated people. I mean, it was very, very common. But then when MAD came along, basically just uh, raised our consciousness. And within a very few years, uh, drunken driving became um, really a stigmatized behavior. Mm -hmm. So we can make these cultural changes. And I think that the uh, penalties for drunk and driving currently, they're about right. Um, I think it's a, a terribly high-risk behavior, not for, only for yourself, but for everybody around you. And it definitely deserves a really stiff punishment. And I think that the MAD has done really a good service in bringing about stiff penalties for this really stupid behavior. Yeah, incidentally, uh, uh, DWI courts have become uh, very common. Uh, National Transportation Safety Board is promoting them, and they um, are amazingly successful. They have a, a relatively low recidivism rate for DWI, and one of the things that, that these courts do is they make it very, very clear that, um, that drinking driving is simply completely unacceptable. Uh, the people who agree to go into these programs actually have to promise to abstain uh, while they're in the programs. And um, the behavior is very closely monitored. And that really should tell us something about behavior. Uh, the more closely we monitor behavior, the more easily we're able to get compliance. I think one of the problems with drunken driving is most people know that the chances they're going to get caught is really quite low. And so having really even draconian penalties won't stop everybody. Uh, but if people come to believe, correctly or incorrectly, that their chances of being apprehended are substantially higher, um, that alone would uh, act as quite a deterrent. That's one of the things MAD tries to uh, push, actually, is having a lot of visible... Um, uh, enforcement, uh, roadblocks, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of it. Also, if people believe, uh, th there's so many different factors. Um, in Japan, you know, drunken driving is so socially disapproved of uh, that it's 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 quite rare compared to the U.S. There's uh, 20. 
20 times fewer drunk driving accidents in Japan than there are in the U.S. I checked out the statistics. Now, I think that's fatalities. So we have 20 times more fatalities in the U.S. than Japan does. One of the reasons is public transportation is the norm. It's available everywhere. Uh, drunken driving is so stigmatized. You don't say, you know, I drove drunk. Everybody around you would, you know, <gasps> You drove drunk. That's horrible. We're not going to talk to you anymore. We're going to ostracize you for the next ten years. It's totally un unacceptable. So it's, and of course, a fear of penalties. Um, in Japan, like New York City, uh, you can't get away with uh, drunk driving in New York City. You know, there's cops everywhere watching. You know, you can't you can't do tra traffic offenses in New York City. You get caught immediately. You're on your cell phone in New York City. They pull you over. They stop you. They fine you. They ticket you. you know? mm -hmm. Well, it's that, that surveillance uh, certainly is, uh, is helpful in, uh, in enforcing norms, enforcing laws. Yeah, so it, the, the uh, surveillance the uh, social attitude, if it is just completely unacceptable to do this, people aren't going to do this. It's kind of like, you know, you can't chew tobacco in New York City. It's not going to be, you know, you're not going to have a lot of friends if you chew tobacco in New York City. It's not, you know, the, it's not the country in North Carolina there or Wisconsin where I, when I was in high school, I chewed tobacco. Well, you didn't turn out to be a baseball player in spite of that, did you? <laughs> I never liked baseball, but I did like chewing tobacco. Uh, you said, you know, I always said uh, in our in our high school manual they had uh, they had rules against smoking, and they had rules against chewing gum in class, but there was no rule against chewing tobacco in class. So I would chew tobacco in class, and I was going, oh, <laughs> say if they caught me, well, it's not in the rule book. <laughs> but I, I was a bad boy. <laughs> You still are. <laughs> yeah, I still I am, yes. Well, we are getting... Let's talk a little bit about recreational drug use, about moderate drug use. So how about all these other drugs that are illegal? Do, are there, is, is heroin 100% addictive to everyone, or are there uh, people who are controlled heroin users? Well, I have to tell you, Ken, that's not my area, really. I am an alcohol man and uh, so I really don't know one of the things that I find frustrating for example when we look at something like marijuana is that the government simply does not conduct research on this and any research that is conducted I can assure you will be focused on trying to find harms uh, with marijuana uh, or any other drug um, the same has happened in alcohol. Um, it, it actually took congressional pressure to get the main agency in the federal government dealing with alcohol, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, to fund any research that looked at the effects, not simply the benefits, but the effects of moderate drinking. Uh, and it was a very small program, uh, but it, it did basically buy off uh, uh, the members of the Congress who were pressing for this sort of uh, research to be conducted. Uh, the government doesn't want um, evidence that, say, drinking in moderation is, um, is beneficial because the official federal policy is to reduce per capita consumption of alcohol. So research that doesn't support that, or isn't likely to support that, um, clearly is not high on the agenda. In fact, it's not on the agenda at all. And I think we could make the same assumptions about drugs, uh, that uh, the, the federal policy is, is clearly anti-use of any drugs, and uh, other than prescription drugs, and that... Uh, it's not inclined to fund research or even conduct research that would raise the kind of questions that you've just asked. You know, it's interesting. You probably saw this study, um, was mentioned in Time magazine, all over the place, that found that heavy drinkers live longer than ab total abstainers. Yes, I did see that. 
Well, you know, what constitutes moderate drinking? Uh, our government has, well, it has actually two different somewhat conflicting guidelines on this. Uh, but the inter interesting thing is if you look around the world, you will find very dramatically different recommended limits for drinking. Now, this suggests that these guidelines are not really based uh, very much on solid science, uh, but on culture and politics. In fact, when the, uh, the UK first came up with its guidelines uh, some years ago, one of the members of the panel acknowledged in writing that they didn't really have very good evidence as to what the maximum uh, consumption should be, and he said, we basically just pulled a figure out of the air. And uh, so if you look at the medical research, you'll find sometimes that there will be benefits uh, for a particular uh, condition, let's say, uh, of drinking, say, f of a man drinking four glasses of alcohol a day or having four drinks a day, uh, and then only at fifth or sixth drink does a problem begin to emerge. For some conditions, like breast cancer, the, the level is much, much lower. Um, but So we have one problem there. We, we just don't have good science telling us what the maximum should be. I mean, we've got the cultural aspects. Uh, uh, in there as well, but then when we ask people, how much do you drink? Not many people, unless they're young people, perhaps college students, are going to exaggerate. Most people are going to minimize. So if research finds that, uh, that harms uh, from drinking alcohol uh, begin after a man consumes an average of three drinks a day, in reality, maybe the harms uh, began after maybe uh, another drink higher. Uh, so we have a number of problems on figuring out what is moderate. But, but the overwhelming evidence from around the world for many decades, in fact going back to 1926 at least, the evidence is we have something of a J curve. If you don't abstain, you're going to have a given health outcome. If you drink more, if you drink some, your health will tend to improve and you will tend to live longer. Then as you continue drinking heavier, you're looking at people who drink more, uh, then we begin coming up to a level that's about where the abstainers were. And then when we go far beyond that, then we have uh, increased harm. But um, people don't realize that that abstaining from alcohol is actually a health and longevity risk factor. Not drinking, unless it's contraindicated, is actually harmful to your health. Yeah, the government doesn't give us any public service announcements about how you need to start drinking to improve your health. You know? Right. <laughs> right. And, and of course, at St. Jude, we're not dealing with people who are drinking in moderation or, or uh or so on. We're dealing with people who uh, drink heavily, typically, and or um, uh, use drugs to the degree that it's uh, having harmful effects in their lives. That's one of the interesting things about substances, like alcohol. Um, in moderation, it can be beneficial, but if too much is harmful. Same with uh, aspirin. Uh, a lot of physicians recommend that people have an aspirin a day, uh, but uh, one aspirin is better than none, but three aren't better than better than one. Uh, and this leads a lot of people to call alcohol, for example, a poison. Well, indeed, if you drink enough alcohol, you can have alcohol poisoning, and you can actually die. A few people do every year. But and so they use that to say alcohol is a poison. Don't drink it at all. Well, anything. I mean, this is uh, pharmacy 101. Uh, the poison is in the dosage. Uh, a little, we, we need salt in our diets, too much bad. We need sugar in our diets, too much bad. We need fat in our diet, too much is bad. And we can use, uh, beneficially, some alcohol, but too much is bad. Well, a lot of people don't realize that water is a poison itself. If you chug two quarts of water, you will die. 
you, you will die of water intoxication because all your electrolytes will go out of balance. And you, I mean, people have died of this quite frequently. They didn't realize. I mean, it's it's a crazy amount that you drink at once, but it kills you. That's right. Uh, this really came to my attention in regard to fraternity hazing. Uh, a number of uh, colleges and uh, then the fraternities uh, prohibited alcohol in, in hazing because it uh, tended to lead to problems. People overconsumed alcohol and had some very negative effects. So some of the fraternities started saying, okay, we can't have people drink an enormous quantity of alcohol. We'll have them drink water, vast quantities of water. And people started dying from that. It's absolutely a good point. We need water. Too much water can be uh, uh, life-threatening. There's a website out there somewhere about the dangers of uh, of uh, dihydrogen oxide, dihydrogen monoxide, which, uh, as you realize, is H2O. And you know, it talks about all the people that are killed by uh, water, by dihydrogen monoxide every year. <laughs> if you start including the floods and everything else, it's a very deadly substance. Well, I think we're coming to the close because we're getting silly now. Uh, but uh, what would you like to leave us with uh, this evening? Well, uh, you shouldn't have asked that because there's so many things. I, I could probably go for an hour, but uh, I would say... Um, Certainly, if people are having a, a problem controlling their alcohol consumption or uh, their drug use, that they should certainly give a serious look at the nonprofit, uh, non religious St. Jude retreats because we really do have the highest certified or documented success rate um, in the United States and I suspect any place else. Uh, you know, 62% success rate is truly remarkable. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, that's the reason that I accepted an invitation to join the board of directors. Uh, this is the kind of place that I would send my uh, brother, sister, uh, son or daughter, any loved one. Uh, and I would do it with great confidence because I know the program so well. I know the facilities. I know the personnel. And... Uh, they simply can't go wrong. Well, you know, I had the same experience. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues, uh, well, Mary Ellen Barnes and Ed Wilson, who run uh, the non 12 step program in California. And they said, well, we don't treat teenagers here. We only treat adults because we don't feel, they said, we're both over 50. We don't feel comfortable treating teenagers. Uh, if teenagers come, we send them to St. Jude. And I said, well, that's interesting. Let me look them up. And I started looking them up, and I saw they ha they have an independent company come in to to do the research. They don't do it in house. And I said nobody does this. Everybody's scared to death of having their numbers looked at. Hazelden doesn't do this. Betty Ford doesn't do it. Nobody. I've never seen a single treatment center in the U.S. that gets an outside company come in and do the numbers. And I was just. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it sold me, really. And, of course, then as I began looking into the program in depth, uh, I became more and more impressed with it. And uh, needless to say, I'm a great uh, uh, booster of the, the group. And like I said, I would send any loved one there without any hesitation with great confidence. Well, it's a philosophy that's very close to harm reduction. Um, it's it reminds me a lot of Pat Denning's harm reduction psychotherapy books um, because it talks about people choose to do what's going to help them. You know, they can choose to use drugs or alcohol to make them feel better as a coping strategy to enhance a positive experience, or they can choose not to use them because they're causing problems, or they can choose to reduce the use because they're causing problems in high levels of use. And it's this whole, the central pivot is not that you have a disease, it's that you have a choice of how you're going to live your life, and you can choose things that will be good for you, that you think are good for you, not that somebody else says, well, this is good for you, so you got to do it. But you can make your choices, you know, if you think about, oh, 
what do I want my life to be like? Maybe you want to choose not to drink alcohol. Maybe you want to choose to drink a lot less. Maybe you want to choose to stay where you are because that's what you really like. But, you know, St. Jude says, this is what life is all about. It's about making choices. Yes, and we're not victims. We're not victims of a disease. Uh, and we're not victims of our child childhood. We're not victims of uh, uh, our schooling or whatever. But we really do have ultimately the the power to make whatever decisions we want to make, and we get to make them, and we get to reap the benefits or the uh, or the or the negative consequences. Okay, that looks like a good place to stop for this evening. So I want to thank you very much for being our guest this evening, Dr. David Hansen. It's been my pleasure. It really has. And we'll have another show for everyone soon, so stay tuned. <laughs>